I'm really excited to be here with you and share uh, my results from my blue water simulations, uh, especially because I feel like this topic of convectively induced turbulence has really um, has the potential to have large societal and economic influences. Um, so I do want to thank my advisor, Gretchen Mullendor, for her assistance with this as well. Okay, so keeping with the theme, um, I use blue waters to simulate thunderstorms at high resolution to study turbulence prediction for aviation applications. Um, in the mid-latitudes and the tropics. And why high-resolution simulations are needed is because turbulence occurs at a scale, a physical scale between 10 meters to 1,000 meters. And operational forecast systems generally run about three kilometers, um, so cannot actually resolve turbulence. And the fact that turbulence occurs on a time scale of uh, seconds to minutes, again, uh, forecasting systems do not um, resolve that, that uh, temporal um, characteristic. The other important part with this research is a lot of um, turbulence studies have solely been done in the mid-latitudes, leaving the tropics kind of like this unknown region where we have planes going there, but we don't have as much information about um, the characteristics of turbulence. The motivation behind this work, it's pretty simple, aviation applications. Uh, in the uh, near future, the next five years, uh, air traffic is um, predicted to increase at a rate of 5%. Um, the greatest increase of flight routes are going to be in the um, Asia-Pacific region and Latin America. And if you think about where we have a lot of uh, ground-based radar systems and satellite-based, those are areas where we're lacking a lot of um, meteorological information. So the big takeaway from increasing um, our flight routes is we have more planes in the sky, and we're putting planes into areas where we have less observations um, from the weather standpoint. Um, the other big thing, like I said, more planes in the sky, that means they have more um, opportunity to get too close to um, weather that could influence their flight. So uh, based on some past studies, 65% uh, of weather-related incidents or accidents are actually caused by turbulence. Um, other uh, incidents could be caused by lightning, hail, um, but turbulence is 65%, so a pretty large uh, percentage. How does turbulence influence um, aircraft? Well, it causes delays. You can get structural damage, like this uh, little plane rudder, <laughs> um, unfortunately, broke. Uh, injuries to passenger and crew, um, instrumentation failure, and in the end, all that means is more money that is lost um, in the aviation industry. So over the past uh, 15 years or so, there were 500 passenger, passengers and crew that were injured due to turbulence. That might not seem like a lot, but when you put a, um, an insurance um, you know, dealing with their injuries on a monetary value, it's a pretty big deal. So the goal of this research is to increase safety and efficiency when we have more planes in the sky in different regions. I do briefly just want to talk about the, um, how uh, turbulence is caused from convection, so convectively induced turbulence. So this nice little thunderstorm schematic, pretty simple. Um, we have, oh, the mouse didn't show up, that's not good. Okay, so well, the um, first way that we can get turbulence um, due to a thunderstorm, let's see. there we go. Um, so we can get, as a thunderstorm penetrates the uh, tropopause region, um, wind flow has to change as it has to go around the thunderstorm. So we can get uh, turbulence from that mechanism. Uh, the second way is just around the cloud boundary itself. Um, a similar wind shear type process uh, and also caused by buoyancy differences. And the third, kind of the more exciting part, I think, of turbulence research um, is convectively generated gravity waves. As our thunderstorm penetrates the tropopause, um, it can hit a critical level um, near the stratosphere and uh, we'll get turbulent or gravity waves that propagate away from the storm and can break in certain environments. And what's really um, important with this process especially is that we need high resolution simulations to capture uh, those gravity waves that can uh, propagate away and break. And they can go more than 100 kilometers away from convection, which is a pretty big deal. So with those in mind, the FAA has created guidelines to help pilots avoid turbulent encounters. Um, so the first is that if a thunderstorm is classified as severe, um, they want pilots to remain 20 miles or about 32 kilometers away from convection um, in a lateral <laughs> avoidance range. Uh, the other is if the thunderstorm is more than 35,000 feet uh, vertical height, um, you're advised to use extreme caution when flying above this thunderstorm. Uh, so that's about 10.6 kilometers. 
Uh, and that's pretty much it. So some pretty uh, lax, I guess, uh, guidelines to help pilots with that. And this is, was all derived from mid-latitude um, studies on turbulence. So we know that turbulence can occur more than 20 miles away, so our lateral threshold's not really helping. Uh, we no longer have a vertical threshold um, to help pilots get up and over thunderstorms. It's just use extreme caution. Like I said, continental mid-latitude convection was uh, how these regulations came about. And in the tropics, our US aviation operations are using the same guidelines, but tropical convection is not the same as mid-latitude convection. And I think the biggest concern with these um, guidelines is that developing convection is a really big hazard for pilots because it's poorly forecasted and they don't have the instrumentation on board all the time uh, to help um, sense developing convection, especially below them. And that is not addressed by the FAA guidelines either. So this is a big concern um, for pilots. So with this, the goal is to make steps towards improving our guidelines. So how are we gonna do that? Um, so generally, uh, turbulent simulations, they're kind of a case study here and there, and it, it's hard to really translate that into policy. So the goal with this study was to begin a database for convectively induced turbulent encounters at high resolution. Uh, so six simulations of convectively induced turbulence were done using uh, the weather research and forecasting model, um, using 500 meter horizontal grid spacing and 350 meter vertical grid spacing at 10 minute output. And the 10 minute output is important because we can capture the life cycle of convection. Um, numerous diagnostics were used to um, get a sense of what turbulence looked like um, from these simulations. So the two big ones I'm gonna show today are eddy dissipation rate, which is a pretty popular uh, diagnostic that can actually be calculated from the aircraft um, wind measurements itself. And then second order structure functions, it's just a um, normalization of our wind components. And then uh, static stability, vertical wind shear, and vertical velocity, they're characteristics of the environment that, um, gen that can help generate turbulence itself. Uh, so these will also be used. And then um, an important method, as I said, the FAA guidelines do not um, classify the hazard based on convective stage. Uh, so we looked at when convection was developing versus when it hit its mature stage. So the six simulations that I did for this study um, I paired them up with a tropical case, so the um, case is in blue, with a mid-latitude case where the cause of turbulence was hypothesized to be the same, so a breaking gravity wave, or the plane was in the wrong place at the wrong time and it you know, went through an updraft. Um, so it was kind of a, let's compare similar cases just in different regions and see what the turbulence looks like in those areas. The, um, the really cool part about using Blue Waters was it allowed me to make domains that could capture the entire life cycle of convection and not really worry about, oh, well, it kind of propagated away out of the domain, so I can't use those times. So I had a lot of grid points to run the model on um, and with some pretty small time steps, so three seconds on a couple of the simulations. And unfortunately, with these simulations, you get really good results, but if you wanted to put that into an operational uh, setup, you, you can't do that because the run times were much longer um, than what would be used for um, an operational forecast. So going into the results, the first thing when you're doing convectively induced turbulent simulations is you gotta make sure your convection's right. Um, so these are showing two cases that were paired together. The blue is over the Gulf of Mexico, the green's over North Dakota on the right. and. Um, what you can see here is these small scale features of convective updraft. Uh, this storm in particular hit um, echo top heights between 15 and 16 kilometers, so right near the tropopause region in the tropics, so it would um, likely generate gravity waves. And then this case here um, was generating echo top heights between 11 and 12, again, um, near the tropopause region in the mid latitudes and would have theoretically produced gravity waves. And both these cases were out of cloud. Uh, the plane was skirting around this, uh, these lines of convection. And so uh, what 500 meter um, resolution allows you to do is look at these small scale features of convection. And you can relate that to gravity wave generation. Now the important part, how did turbulence look for uh, this one case in particular over North Dakota? So on the left I have eddy dissipation rate. Um, and then on the right I have structure functions. And you can clearly see uh, so the red being severe and the yellow moderate, there's a pretty drastic difference between the two diagnostics and which one is right and which one is wrong. 
um, we're theorizing that structure functions actually does a better job of replicating the intensity and um, aerial coverage of turbulence uh, based on radar observations. Um, and eddy dissipation rate for all uh, six cases seem to be hit or miss, and I think that has to do with the planetary boundary layer scheme that I'm using, so definitely more future work to be done on that. Uh, so just overall, there's a big discrepancy between some of our two most popular uh, turbulence diagnostics. Okay, uh, the other thing that was really cool with uh, this project, it allowed me to compare those cases to one another. Uh, so here on the left, I'm showing uh, turbulence distribution. So as you go to the right, our turbulence strength is increasing. Um, on the y-axis, as you go up, that's the probability. So higher probability is towards the top. Uh, the colored lines represent our turbulence intensity. So yellow and beyond is moderate to severe. And the f I wanted to relate that to our echo top heights as well. Um, so for our paired cases um, uh, that had cases where it was developing convection-based incident, um, you can see that this case had much higher probability of encountering turbulence um, compared to our tropical run that had a similar cause of turbulence. And if you look at echo top heights, the distributions are pretty separated from one another. So lower echo top heights we had a lower probability of encountering turbulence, which makes a lot of sense. Now, when we had cases where um, another mid-latitude versus tropical uh, comparison, where our echo top heights were more similar to one another, although in uh, separate regions, our turbulence uh, probabilities were much closer to one another, especially out of cloud. Um, and then the same was true for um, my last two cases, uh, where convection was actually really strong for these two cases. Um, and again, their echo top height distributions uh, matched each other pretty closely. And turbulence was, again, um, the probabilities were similar to one another. Now, if I break that down into looking at the convective stage, um, again, we have turbulence intensity uh, increasing to the right and probability increasing as we go up uh, the same six cases. Uh, the dashed lines are our tropical cases, and the solid lines are mid-latitude. <coughs> And you can see, again, there's this pretty big discrepancy, um, especially near mature convection, where you have higher probability in the mid-latitudes near uh, mature convection of encountering turbulence. But what's really important, and it was, I was really surprised at what happened when I subset it by developing convection, the probability of en encountering turbulence in the tropics increased by an order of magnitude. So an area where we have less observations and we have um, more planes potentially flying in, our probabilities are going um, up pretty significantly. So we need to start addressing this type of convection in uh, the tropical region. And when I broke that down, um, looking at the environmental characteristics, so I had mentioned I used static stability, but that really didn't end up um, influencing the probability of turbulence. But vertical wind shear, um, which kind of makes sense if you think about how I said that vertical wind shear, you, you get turbulence from um, that variation. And what we saw here was, again, in the mid-latitude, or the, for mature convection, there's a pretty big spread between the cases. And that has to do um, with the type of convection itself. But when we go near developing convection, again, um, vertical wind shear increased significantly for our tropical cases, uh, which increases our probability of encountering turbulence. So from a forecasting standpoint, if our diagnostics aren't doing that well, it's possible that we could use our environmental characteristics to characterize um, the turbulence uh, potential. So the broader impacts for this study, yes, it's only six cases, um, but we know that our FAA guidelines are not um, addressing um, you know, region-specific, they're not storm-stage-specific, and they're not storm-type-specific. So uh, isolated cells versus a mesoscale convective system, you have different profile or different characteristics of turbulence. Uh, so we need to start addressing that as well, especially if we want aviation to be more efficient and you know, save money in the end. Um, we are seeing that classic mid-latitude turbulence diagnostics are not performing well in the tropics, and that's a concern as more planes are flying in that area. Uh, the computational expenses needed to predict turbulence, you've got to have high-resolution simulations, and those are expensive. And so how do you put that into an operational um, setup? It, it's going to be a challenge. Um, we definitely need more simulations, and I will keep pushing that, and maybe a field campaign would be great, um, to really uh, influence policy change at the government level. So conclusions, I did some simulations of turbulence. 
I compared some various diagnostics. I broke convection down into different stages to analyze turbulence and found that developing convection is a big concern. Um, vertical wind shear might possibly be able to be related uh, to turbulence probability when our diagnostics aren't doing well. Um, and we definitely need more research and that um, I would really, if anyone wants to fund a field campaign, I'm in. Um, so with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, some of my co-authors from NCAR, B. Kuderling, Bob Charman, Stan Trier, uh, Domingo Molinez, and Blue Waters for all your help, especially my point of contact, uh, Tom Cortese, and uh, it was a great experience and I would um, hopefully something like this continues in the future for maybe another supercomputer. And with that, I'll take questions.